Sjeh je ali da zuri, je ali da zuri, je ali da zuri. Jedno dekter jožan je jožlav sabu, jožlav sabu i rozare. Slovenia, and after that, we've got a very special treat for you, so stand by. Yeah. 
where we can hear firsthand from those people who lived our history. And that's what today is all about, families in flight, first, person's ac first person accounts of a story that impacted this county's history, this state's history, and national history. So again, my name is Joanne grahek Kuhn. I feel a special affinity for everybody in the room. Uh, I share a pride in my history too, so uh, without further ado, I present the moderator for today's program. That would be Joe Valencic, a historian, a filmmaker, and the executive director of the National Cleveland Style Polka Hall of Fame. Joe. <laughs> Thank you all for the invitation. Uh, as uh, Joanne said, this was a project we started a few months ago. I'm no stranger to this area. I've uh, been hosted by the uh, Bouchards here in Gary New Duluth before, and I've spoken several times for the St. Louis County Historical Society. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Joanne Kuhn, the executive director, and also Kathleen Cargill for uh, uh, really uh, making this uh, happen, uh, and also the Gary New the, the League Alliance for uh, offering their facilities and their assistance too. Um, you can, I'm uh, come from an unusual background. My parents were both born in Slovenia, and I was raised uh, in a bilingual family, so I'm fluent in Slovenian, and over the years I've, uh, I guess you could say, uh, taken advantage of that and uh, created, uh, I think, cultural and, uh, and uh, personal bridges between uh, the United States and Slovenia. I lecture there quite often. I talk about Slovenian immigration to the United States. I've also made connections for Slovenians outside of the border of Slovenia, in Italy, in Hungary, in Austria, and in Croatia. And I often find many similarities between the Slovenians who live outside the borders with the uh, Slovenian immigrant experience here uh, in the United States. Um, so it's a, a, a labor of love to be able to do this, but uh, we, in our discussion, uh, we found uh, commonality uh, um, uh, with, well, how shall we say this? If today, the, uh, the subject of refugees is very current and certainly something that's been making headlines uh, in the United States for the past few years. Especially in 2015, it was uh, a, a serious issue in Slovenia where hundreds of thousands of refugees uh, passed through Slovenia uh, from uh, the Middle East on their way uh, to uh, uh, Sweden, Germany, and other countries to establish new lives. And that was also, for many, uh, a subject of controversy. But amid all the headlines, one story that uh, is often neglected is that of the children in this uh, transitory uh, process. And uh, as with uh, uh, waves of history before, there have been other refugees. And uh, there is a story here in Minnesota of the uh, uh, Slovenian children who came here and were resettled uh, after World War II uh, from, uh, from what was then Slovenia, the former Yugoslavia. And uh, so we're hoping that you know we can uh, discuss today and, and uh, experience how in the aftermath of World War II, thousands of uh, refugee families resettled here from these internment camps, or DP camps as they were called, displaced persons camps. And uh, folks, and especially children, were uprooted for their homes, but now these children, grown up, are here to share their stories about starting new lives uh, here in Minnesota and in the United States. There were many challenges, uh, learning a new language, a new way of life, uh, food, cultural identities, and also uh, helping their families through the trauma of uh, displacement. Because many of these families spent uh, uh, years and months in uh, uh, displaced person camps, uh, and uh, uh, which were sort of a microcosm of society and of themselves, which we'll uh, hear more about. But we want to find out what were their lives before, like before Minnesota, uh, and then what it was like to come here and how they became Americans here. And we had several folks who were going to help us th with that. Um, after World War II, the United States admitted uh, more than a quarter million displaced Europeans. 
Then Congress enacted the Displaced Persons Act of 1948, which allowed another 400,000 from Europe, uh, many from uh, uh, communist countries like Yugoslavia, to come to the United States. I know with my own family, my mother served as citizenship witness for seven uh, uh, Slovenians coming to this country, and we also uh, sponsored, uh, uh, my confirmation sponsored, Danilo, uh, to come here from Slovenia. So I know the process firsthand, even as young as I was. Uh, hundreds of girls and boys were uprooted for their homes, uh, from their homes throughout Slovenia. And uh, we're going to find out about the impact of displacement on children, especially these Slovenian children. And uh, you could almost say that they were interrupted childhoods. Uh, some uh, lost contact with their families and friends. Uh, some had a difficult time adjusting. Some adjusted just fine. Um, so we will we'll find out uh, um, uh, through our speakers today. Before resettlement, uh, what was their life like as children? Well, there was the trauma of war, uh, reasons why families came here, uh, you know, persecution due to political opinion, religion, nationality, uh, membership in a particular group. Uh, children had to, were exposed to separation from uh, their family, their homeland, their loss of loved ones, and a familiar life. Uh, in the transition, they may have dealt with poverty, lack of control in their lives, and uh, living between moments of crisis and, uh, and uh, periods of boredom, anticipation alternating with hopelessness. These stays in the camps were often very lengthy. Children were born and raised in exile, and knowing some of them knowing little beyond their life in the camps. So what we're doing here is an unusual approach to uh, the displaced persons' uh, um, resettlement to, to uh, the United States after World War II, in that it's from the point of view of children, and we have these first-hand witnesses, uh, these uh, children with us today to tell their stories. We have uh, Frank Medved. Uh, many of you in Minnesota know about the Medved family dynasty, so to speak. Uh, uh, the fam there were eight in the family, uh, six children who arrived uh, here in December of 1949 uh, from near Krain. Uh, Frank was age eight years old and uh, uh, spent, uh, was it four years uh, in Vitrinia, five years in Vitrinia, um, came to Minnesota, and I guess it was all uphill from there, right? Uh, he uh, was a chief engineer, uh, he worked for General Mills, uh, uh, designing digital computers uh, when that was evolving, uh, eventually uh, uh, creating tracking stations for NASA, uh, became chief engineer of Honeywell in charge of uh, a thousand engineers, uh, but uh, he all had he had to start somewhere. It was in Slovenia, but uh, he is our first uh, uh, child of families in flight. Frank Benson. I'm 83 year old, just. <laughs> In uh, uh, our journey started really in uh, uh, in uh, February of 1945. Our fate was sealed at the Yalta Conference. That's uh, the conference at which Yugoslavia was handed over to Stalin as a war price. And so uh, when uh, uh, the war ended in May of 1945, uh, those of us who uh, were not on the communist side had to uh, flee for our lives. So uh, my parents uh, borrowed a horse and wagon from a farmer, uh, loaded up with supplies, and uh, we don't have a picture of that, but here you see a picture of uh, people uh, migrating across the Bell Pass uh, from Slovenia to Austria. That was the only route that was open at that time. The routes to Italy were closed. Uh, so 
it took uh, five days to make this journey, uh, which in, uh, today you can make it in about 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, we, when we came to the, uh, across to Austria, it was the British occupational zone. Uh, and, uh, you know, at that time, uh, Austria was divided into a British, French, German, I'm sorry, uh, Russian and uh, uh, American zones, okay? So we wound up in the British zone uh, in a place called Vitrinia, big field. 50,000 people uh, were packed into this uh, area. Uh, we trampled farmers' crops. This is where the British uh, uh, Army directed us to, to stop and camp. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, we were kind of a problem for the Brits, uh, and the British commander had a uh, problem with the uh, uh, partisans doing guerrilla warfare there, so he made a deal with them that he would return us to Slovenia uh, in return for Tito not bothering his, uh, uh, spoiling his day in, uh, in Austria. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the British, what well, they told us, they were going to resettle us to Italy. So, no problem, you know, you just get into these boxcars and we will ship you to Italy. Well, uh, they first shipped 15,000, uh, uh, the first were the military types, uh, 15,000 democracy, and uh, uh, they were immediately tortured and executed. Uh, and, uh, but some of them escaped, uh, well, the word got back to the train yet, and uh, uh, so our family was uh, about six hours away from being loaded into boxcars and shipped back for an execution. Uh, but fortunately, uh, Field Marshal Alexander, who was the commander of the Mediterranean forces, or the Allied forces, came for a visit, and uh, our spo uh, spokesperson, uh, 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 Dr. Marshall, uh, talked to him, and uh, Field Marshal Alexander put a stop to this repatriation, so that's why I'm here today. <laughs> okay, so uh, after about three, four months out in, the, in these fields, uh, uh, by the way, the horse that brought us to uh, to uh, uh, to Vitrinia, uh, we eventually ate the horse. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, at, uh, by uh, um, August and uh, uh, September, they started moving us to uh, various uh, uh, DP camps. Uh, you can see there were six of them uh, in Austria. Uh, we were, uh, this was in the British occupation zone. Uh, I can't get the... I, I can't see it, okay. Well, you can see Spital uh, is where uh, we work. Uh, Frank Bukhart uh, was born in Spital. Uh, the um, uh, John uh, Jacques went to this Judenburg uh, 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 camp. Uh, but uh, there were six camps around. Uh, so what happened uh, uh, was our family was assigned to the DP camp Spital. Uh, which was a, uh, uh, a German uh, prisoner war camp for Russian prisoners. Uh, so, uh, and they were used to build a town uh, for uh, the Hitler's Autobahn to Istanbul. Well, uh, this uh, was uh, the winter, the first winter at, at that camp. Uh, in, uh, you can see the next uh, summer, uh, uh, you saw all these gardens. Where you see the, the rows of gardens, that was a, uh, a, a double 15-foot-high uh, barbed wire fence, two fences, uh, which surrounded the camp uh, before us. So, uh, the, uh, this little uh, barrack here, uh, I, uh, this the pointer doesn't work. <laughs> uh, Okay, if you uh, uh, want to know more about uh, the situation in refugee camps, there's an excellent book that's written in English, uh, written by John Crosellis. Uh, he uh, uh, was a, uh, a pacifist, uh, so he was an ambulance driver in the British Army, uh, and he wrote really regular letters to his mother in England. And at the, then, uh, uh, and after the war, he wrote uh, a book, he best based on those letters, 
about uh, his experience, and this is a view of us refugees from an outsider's perspective. Uh, so you can get that book on the Amazon. Uh, our uh, Barrett, the one we were assigned to, was one of the two horse barns uh, on the camp. Uh, and this was Barrett 18. Uh, we were in the uh, two windows down from the middle door there. Okay. And this is our family in 1948 or early 49 uh, in front of the uh, our two horse. We were assigned a two horse stall for the family for the five years. That was our home. But you can see we made it into quite, quite a nice, nice home at this from the outside. Okay. Uh, Lunch time. Okay. Uh, everything was cooked uh, in big uh, pressure cookers. Uh, and you had to stand in line with your little can. Everything was a soup. It was start, started with water and then they had something they would put in it. Uh, uh, the objective was to feed us with eight, 800 calories per day. That was, uh, uh, there, was, uh, there were shortages after the Second World War. Uh, so uh, what held the people together? And this camp, I think, was somewhat different from most refugee camps in that uh, uh, well, one of the big things was the, uh, the expression of uh, faith. Uh, faith was a big item that held these people together. Uh, the, uh, here's a chapel that was made out of the truck garage. Uh, you can see some of the chandeliers that you see. Uh, my father made those. Uh, they were uh, uh, from uh, aluminum parts from Messerschmitt uh, airplanes. The Messerschmitt, there was a Messerschmitt sub-assembly plant uh, near the camp. Uh, all the, the lights around uh, the uh, Blessed Virgin there uh, are cockpit uh, lights from Messerschmitt airplanes. Uh, and the painting itself, uh, you know, things were scarce, was done in chalk by a famous artist, uh, uh, Bourgeois Cremots, who migrated to Canada later. Um, the processions around camp. Uh, here is a first communion of my brother Miro. A uh, very spiffy occasion, you can see. Uh, he uh, had uh, a uh, uh, nice outfit. Uh, the, the clothing was made from my mother's uh, suit. Uh, that was, you know, kind of ragged and uh, it could be uh, recycled. Uh, the shoes that he's wearing were a, a, a pair of sandals that uh, my dad made with wooden soles and some leather straps, but he looked good. <laughs> uh, my brother and sister for information. Uh, the, the other big thing we had this after faith was the <coughs> education emphasis. Uh, okay, uh, the uh, I remember when we came to the tree and to that field. Three days after we came there, school started. We had classes out in the grass. Okay, uh, when we came here, uh, the uh, immediately started more formal schools. You can see the kindergarten here, first grade. I think uh, there is my brother Miro, I think, in the second grade. Uh, uh, next to the teacher. Yeah, next to the teacher, supervised, yes. <laughs> well, uh, at age 11, uh, I was sent to, uh, there was another camp up in Tyrol, which was a nicer territory. I was sent there to go to the first, to the gymnasium, and which is essentially high school, okay? Uh, that was the worst, part of my life uh, because uh, I was away from the family in a totally strange place, you know, starting in school uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but I survived and I remember things like the people that were quite nice, the Theronians were uh, friendly to us, unlike the, uh, the Kara and the Kärntners uh, down in Lower Austria. Uh, so, but this camp had a, a very good school. Uh, but the British thought it was very nice. This camp had good sanitation facilities and so on. So they decided to close it and move everybody back to Spital. Where Can I ask a question? Yeah. What language did they teach you in? Uh, Slovenian. Okay. Okay. But of course, you had to take uh, you know uh, a, a, a current languages like German or Italian, mm -hmm. and you had to take Latin and Greek. Okay. <laughs> um, so. Uh, so they closed this and moved us back to, to Spital. Uh, and so this is my second uh, second year of gymnasium class with the professors. Uh, 
Uh, I'm in the front row. Next to me uh, is uh, uh, a fellow named Franz Sobodev, who is my the same direct, same horse barn that I lived in. Uh, he uh, became a cardinal uh, uh, in about 10 years ago, so uh, my wife and I went to visit him because his family migrated to Argentina. Most of our friends moved, moved to Argentina, so we haven't seen each other for 55 years. And uh, uh, there was another cardinal that came out of this, uh, 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 this uh, school. He was the uh, uh, Cardinal Aloysius uh, Ambrosic of the Cardinal of Toronto, Canada. Uh, so it's been an uh, um, excellent uh, education that we got there. So for the kids, uh, it was an adventure, you know. Uh, when we came to Vitrinia, uh, I was nine, uh, eight, nine years old, uh, at, uh, actually eight years old, I turned nine while we were there, and I saw bulldozers for the first time in my life. They were bulldozing trenches, which were going to be out of grace because they expected a mass, uh, 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 you know, uh, epidemics. And so the bridge were getting ready, so we had to have some place to put some body. But I was fascinated by that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you, you, come to, uh, you come to camp, uh, there was great schools, all kinds of social activities, a uh, uh, couple times a year, uh, two of the years, so uh, the YMCA sponsored camps for us. We go, go for four weeks to a camp, come back, uh, 15, 20 pounds fatter, you know, <laughs> that was, uh, okay, and uh, uh, so uh, it was a, one adventure after another, bicycling, uh, a lot of athletic, there were a lot of Olympic uh, medalists uh, that organized sports in the camp, uh, there was so, uh, <coughs> social activities, a lot of choirs, uh, for example, here you see uh, um, Franz Michalic, uh, uh, who organized the choir. Uh, there was a classical choir that performed all over Austria in uh, live radio. Uh, fun, uh, fun music from Sunday afternoons. A uh, lot of publications, uh, daily newspapers, uh, you name it. It all happened uh, in camp. And <clears throat> so uh, the parents, that was for the parents it was a different story. But I think for the kids, uh, if it wasn't for the food, we'd be in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, um, yeah, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, Frank, so what was the transition like for you coming to the United States? I mean, you weren't learning English in the class. You had to, uh, I mean, uh, how, did, how did that work for you? Well, uh, remember, uh, most of the people were, uh, uh, the U.S. at that time was not accepting very many people. They were, Canada was accepting young people, uh, so we were all studying Spanish to go to Argentina. And uh, then when we got to notice that there was a sponsor willing to take us in the U.S. at first, a no-brainer. Uh, uh, but uh, we started uh, learning English about two weeks of English. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but when we came here, uh, we knew words like. Uh, Apple, you know, uh, that's an apple, <laughs> and bread, you know, that, but that, that was the extent of it. Uh, uh, however, uh, when we came to Northern Minnesota, uh, we were just uh, plunged into uh, uh, a classroom, all ages of kids, with Mrs. Oberstar for about three weeks before Christmas, reading the contained books. After Christmas, we were placed into grades according to age, you know. My, uh, I was put into eighth grade, the first assignment being to read David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Uh, well, with a very lousy Slovenian dictionary, I read till five o'clock every night for two weeks. At the end of two weeks, I went to the kids in class that read the book. So, but that's how you learn English. That's right, well, no problem. Frank, thank you. introduce. Our next speaker is here from the Twin Cities, from St. Paul to be specific. He's the past president of the Twin Cities Slovenian Association, uh, Mr. John Jockel. Uh, before coming to this area, you were raised in Cleveland. Well, actually, let's go further back. He was born, uh, which you were born in Spital, 
Uh, no, it's actually Trofaya. Trofaya, okay, yes. And uh, came here, obviously, as a, a very young child, first settled in the Cleveland area. And um, you uh, will tell us a little bit more about yourself, but uh, what is unusual about uh, John's situation is his father kept a very detailed journal of his life in the camps. And recently, well, about 10 years ago, maybe, uh, it was serialized in uh, the Slovenian American newspaper, American Home, in Shkodnovina, and uh, it was a rare opportunity for people to have insights in what the day-to-day -day life was like in the camps, and then the transition to the United States, and also, in a sense, documenting your childhood, or at least your early childhood. So, uh, John, uh, uh, trend, now, Correct me if I'm wrong, but your father was a little secretive about his journal, and he wrote it in Esperanto so that no one else could read it. Not Slovenian, not English, obviously, Esperanto, but John uh, then uh, um, uh, translated that and had it serialized, and uh, there are copies in different uh, archives across the United States. So let me present to you, from St. Paul, John Jockel. Dobar dan. You all know what that means, right? Very good, very good. And hvala lepa. Thank you, thank you to Joel. Thank you to Frank. You know, I've heard variations of uh, Frank's story uh, two or three times, and every time he tells it, I hear something new. Uh, terrific. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing it again, yeah, Frank. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, as... Um, Joe said, uh, I was born in a refugee camp in Austria. That is me with my parents. A couple months before we came to America, we arrived uh, Christmas 1949. Uh, I was a year and a half old at that time. And uh, we arrived, um, our sponsors were a farm, an older farm couple in Willard, Wisconsin. They had 80 acres and 10 cows and they shared that with us. Uh, needless to say, it wasn't enough for two families. Uh, so after six months, uh, we moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where the jobs were. And Cleveland is uh, where I grew up. Um, so, and as Joe says, um, much of my information from my very early years uh, comes from my father. Um, my father lived to be 98. And during the last 15 years of his life, uh, I worked closely with him, um, translating and publishing his diary. Uh, as Joe says, it was originally written in Esperanto. So first he translated into Slovenian, and then I translated from Slovenian to English. Uh, and we published it in the Slovenian American Times in Cleveland, <coughs> serialized in English, and we published it also in Slovenia in Slovenian. Um, so it's nice to have the benefit of that. Um, I, I worked with him, only about 10 years were published, but I actually worked with him on his diaries from the 1920s through the 30s, the war years, the refugee camp years, and then the first 10 years or so in Cleveland. So that really gave me a perspective. Um, there we go, there's my father. We always called him Atta. Um, that's his picture in 1946. Before the war, my father was a manager of a shoemaker's cooperative. He was a leader in his community. And continuing into the refugee camps, he was a confident and capable man. This was not the man that I saw as I was growing up. I saw a man who was frequently depressed, burdened by work and responsibility. And I didn't realize until I worked on his diaries how much the refugee experience changed him, affected who he was, and then that affected who I was. My parents, and I think most of the other parents that you'll hear today, did not want to leave Slovenia. Um, they have no other choice. My parents were recruited at gunpoint to join the communists. 
The communists said they were fighting the Nazis, but mostly they were fighting other Slovenians for control of the country. My parents escaped from the communists. They would be treated as deserters if they were caught. So their only choice was to become refugees. They were in various refugee camps, uh, the, some of the ones that Frank talked about, uh, for four and a half years. Uh, Joe, if there's a picture, that, thank you, go back to their, uh, they got married in the camp in 1946. They left to, together in 1945 and figured, well, 1946, they better make it legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> And then I came along a couple years later. <clears throat> when I was uh, little in Cleveland, my parents always spoke of Slovenia as their real home. But gradually that faded. For many years after the war, my parents' brothers and sisters were in prisons back in Slovenia. And in 1954, my grandmother, uh, my father's mother, died. And it was things like that that caused my parents to realize very painfully that they might never be able to go home again. My father was hospitalized a number of times for what they at that time called, quotes, nerves. Uh, I think today it would be called post-traumatic stress syndrome, or PTSD. And that hung on for many years. I think getting his story published many years later helped to heal some of those wounds. Finally, his story came out, the story which the Slovenian government did not allow to be published for 50 years until Slovenia became free of the communists. So in Cleveland, in America, um, my, my father accepted whatever work he could get. And in Cleveland, that meant working in hot, noisy, dirty factories. And in those days, uh, as Frank said, uh, refugees were called displaced persons, DPs. Uh, he wrote in his diary about how being a DP probably affected his ability to get work and housing. He had to settle for what he could get. Many Americans, even some old-time Slovenians, didn't understand the civil war that raged in Slovenia during the World War. Some Americans accused him of being a Nazi collaborator, and this hurt my father deeply. <clears throat> I remember American kids who called us DPs. And I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I knew it wasn't good. And I knew that we had to work harder than anyone else to prove that we belong. But my parents made sure that we had enough food. They often talked about how hungry they were in the refugee camp. Like uh, Frank said, a bowl of soup, and you're lucky if you got something in it. So they appreciated having enough food in America. So me growing up, the only kind of hunger that I knew was uh, I had a desire for soda pop, soft store-bought bread, and store-bought cookies. Those were the things I couldn't get. But my parents' stories about real hunger did sink in. And even to this day, I can't stand to see food wasted. My parents were struck by some of the changes in values. Uh, in the refugee camp, they supplemented their camp rations by making and selling bobbin lace, which they sold in the towns near the camp. Here's uh, some samples of their work. In America, my mother took me with her as she went door to door to try to sell bobbin lights. And she was very disappointed to find that nobody in America wanted to buy the lights. Things were different. But we got by, and our family grew and prospered. My parents sacrificed and worked hard, and we received help from many people, Slovenian and non-Slovenian. During our first five years, 
two brothers and a sister were born. And here I am with uh, my mother and my first brother in 1952. Every year or two, my parents would go to the hospital. <laughs> they'd come back and they'd say, we bought another baby. <laughs> so I figured we must be doing okay. <laughs> And during that time, my father also bought two old houses, one to rent to other people and one to live in. Uh, we didn't get a car, a TV, or a telephone until many years later, uh, but I never felt poor. And so here I am, uh, if you could do the next slide, after my second brother was born. And then the next slide is our family in 1954. It certainly helped that we had a large Slovenian community around us in Cleveland. It was very important to my parents to retain their Slovenian traditions and values and to pass those on to their children. We went to Slovenian church every day and we prayed a lot at home too. We had to go to Slovenian school every Saturday morning. Here's a picture of the students and the teachers in our Slovenian school. That was just one of the Slovenian schools in Cleveland. But I wished I could be one of those American kids who could play while we went to school. <laughs> but Frank mentioned, even in the refugee camp, they set up schools in three days. And to our parents, a good education was number one. You made sure you went to school, you studied hard, and um, you made sure you learned. So they made sure that we had enough money to live on, we had love and discipline at home, and I recall a generally happy childhood. Um, go to the next slide. Here are my uh, two brothers and my sister after she was born in 1955. There were some difficulties, um, especially not knowing English when I went to school. Um, I, I um, didn't have money to buy milk or lunch at school, um, but I learned English quickly, and I learned to get by without the school milk or the school lunch. And um, we, I, I, I wound up doing well in school, I wound up being one of the best students. Uh, I learned to work hard, and I learned to tolerate and respect differences among people. And that's still a large part of what I am today. And so I have my parents to thank for that. If you'd like to read more about um, my family's story, uh, you can Google uh, Zakel, Z-A-K-E-L-J, diary. And um, about 10 years of my father's diary is uh, available there in Slovenian and English. So, thank you. So, so, growing up, uh, making the transition here, were there any types of social service programs, especially for children or for families? Hmm. Good question. Um, you know, you asked about growing up here, but one thing I'm reminded of is in the refugee camp, my father writes about how significant the social worker was in the refugee camp. And maybe they didn't even know there were social workers there. But um, uh, materials were very difficult to find. And part of what my father did in the refugee camp was try to figure out some work for the people who had nothing to do. And so making lace was one of the projects he figured out. And he could sell the lace outside the camp, but there was no thread, there were no needles, no materials. And so talking with the social worker, she said, well, how can I help? And he said, can you please get us some thread? And so she figured out a way to get them some thread. 
so that then they could make bobbin lace in the camp, and then he was able to go around the towns in the area, sell the bobbin lace, and that by doing that, they could supplement the 800 calorie ration. So that's just one example of a social worker who helped us in the camp. Okay. Um, you also mentioned, uh, Frank mentioned John Purcellus, who was a, kind of a social worker with the Quakers. Um, and uh, as I was working on my father's diary, I connected with Mr. Purcellus in England, and he helped me with the diary, which was really pretty cool. I thought, wow, he answered my email, and he, he said, he was so excited to find my father's diary. And he said, absolutely, I'll help you any way I can. Wonderful guy. But that was his mission, was working in the camp with all these refugees. Uh, you will notice through um, the St. Louis County Historical Society, we have a copy of Root Prints, Following the Paths of Our People and Places. And of course, they are a primary sponsor of today's uh, presentation. We have uh, some extra copies there. And the reason is because you can read the story of Frank Bouchard and his transition from uh, the camps here to Minnesota. And uh, the title is, This Is My Song, which is appropriate because of his long time involvement with the singing Slovenes. So ladies and gentlemen, Frank Bouchard. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, first of all, uh, Frank, I'm not as high tech as you with that pointer, the laser pointer there. <laughs> So I, I just use a pointer to Marichka there, point to her, and then she'll move my slides. <laughs> anyway, first of all, thank you to the St. Louis County Historical Society for the opportunity to tell our story, especially Joanne Kuhn and uh, Kathleen Cargill, who encouraged me to tell my story with, this is my song, uh, to Helene, Helene Abbott, let me back there for allowing me to use that title. She thought of that, and I thought it was very appropriate. And also to my daughter-in-law, Leslie Bukar, for helping me write the story. Uh, I would encourage people to, I don't know if there's any left, the that publication that came out, Root Prints. And uh, I couldn't believe the story after I came out, the uh, photo there, etc. But it was a job well done. Thank you again, Kathleen. But a great thing. Who knows, maybe there will be a book written afterward. But this uh, story, Ryan, it's a lot more detail in that than what we have time for right now. Uh, anyway, my story, uh, 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 transpires from the camp uh, to arriving in the United States and how going up to Gary Ruth was on a was on a day to day basis. And of course a special thank you to Joe Lunchich for putting this program together. And also uh, we'll be seeing him in Cleveland during the Thanksgiving Book Hall of Fame. We look forward to that also. So um, to give you a little bit of background about my my family, my parents, uh, my dad, he served in the old Yugoslav army and he served his time in Serbia. So after he spent that the time there, of course there was conscription back then, so uh, they had to do their time in the army. Uh, after he came back from there, of course, then the Second World War broke out, and of course he, they had the major big civil war, and he was on the side of the Demogranzi, the Home Guard. So of course when they lost, they had to leave. And what happened was, uh, my parents came from peasant stock. Peasant stock, and I'll tell you, I'm really glad we did. We had a great time, and we, we enjoyed our, and ourselves. And what they did, uh, they got married over there, and they worked, uh, they were gardeners working for a uh, land baron, and uh, the place was called Stormwall, for those of you that have ever been there. It's a small little castle. Anyway, when they fled uh, through the Lobel Pass, that's the road they took, um, they also had a six-month-old baby boy named Vid. They couldn't take him along. They left him back for my aunt, my mom's sister, to raise him. And people are always, always ask, you know, how could you leave a you know, six-month behind? And, well, uh, I guess myself, I never found out until just a, recently, a few years back. You know, I made about 30, 39 trips back to Slovenia. And you think I'd ask some of these questions about history, very, very important things. Uh, you know, where, where did they live and this and that. And when I went over there, all we did was have a good time. The, the history part wasn't that important to me. Until now, you get old and you start thinking about this. I encourage you, any of you that, you know, for your history of your families, that do it now before it's too late. Uh, my last aunt that any, had any knowledge of our history back during the war, 
she passed away just a, a week or two before we came to Slovenia this last year. So there we can get some of the information. And uh, I also had a, my dad's uh, oldest brother, his name was Joja. And he was one that unfortunately was sent back to the refugee camps back in Yugoslavia, was executed uh, there. And he was 34 years old when that happened. And he was a carpenter by trade. And I really regret now that, uh, right now, there's no known pictures of him, so we don't even know what he looked like. So we're still going to pursue that through the second cousins there, uh, etc. So anyway, uh, 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 when he did uh, flee into the into Austria, um, that was in '45, spring of '45, and then I was uh, born there in 1947. So remember, they got there in '45. I was born in '47, so they're there two years already, and then we're there for another three years, make it five years until we came came over in 1950. Uh, and of course, during that time, my brother was left behind with my hand to raise him. So anyway, if we can have that first slide. I don't remember much of going up in the camp because I was too little. I didn't, uh, so maybe that was a good thing. I didn't experience the, you know, the hunger thing or whatever. I do remember my mom going to the canteen or whatever to get, bring hot chocolate, cacao, they called it, cacao. And uh, so there I was about two and a half years old right there. And uh, I think the next slide, uh, what we have then too is uh, there's some of the barracks that we were in. It's my mom and dad and uh, my dad holding me. Uh, there, of course, still during this time, uh, they didn't know the fate of my brother, how that was going back there in uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, can you the next slide, please? Uh, this next picture is a group photo in, in uh, Spital there. And I didn't know anybody there, of course, they're too small, but we're, my family, my mom and dad, were in the far right-hand lower corner. That uh, is within, of course, I didn't know anybody in that camp during that time. Okay, um, next slide. And there, here we are now in the United States. And uh, prior to coming to the United States, the only thing I remember is we, we flew uh, to the United States. And I was talking to just before this, and they took a boat. You know, so I don't know how we ended up with the plane, but I do remember a little kid looking out the window, and I know it was winter time because I looked down, and all I could see was it was either a field or a frozen lake. It was white, and a little boy running after the shadow of the airplane. He's trying to catch it, and then he fell down, and he was looking up at the plane. And I will never forget that. That's the only thing I can remember is a little, little boy. So, anyway, in the States here, uh, then we have, uh, I'm the oldest one there, my younger brother Andrew, Andy, so he was also born in the camp, he was six months old when he came here, so he was born up there also, and then so there were two of us, three of us actually born over there in both Yugoslavia and Nishpital. And then uh, my mom holding her, her youngest boy, brother Johnny, okay, and then uh, Michi, her, her sister, she wasn't born yet, she was born a few years later. Uh, okay. Then, uh, back to the, uh, oh, can, Mayor, can you go back to the previous talk about growing up what it was? Yes, and we did get, it, it, when I was growing up in the neighborhood there, I was very fortunate um, as far as learning the English language. I was only three years old. So, of course, my parents, they spoke Slovenian in the house. And then I'd go outside and play with the neighborhood kids. And I remember especially the, 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 the families there, the Doshans, we had, we had a number of kids there too, so we did. And I learned English without even realizing it. Nothing to it, nothing to it, so it was great. And, uh, and I do remember in the neighborhood, the young kids, uh, or whoever their parents, you know, calling us DPs, very derogatory. And I honestly believe they, they really didn't know what that meant, nor did I. I didn't, but just suddenly it, it hurt your feelings. And uh, I'll explain to that a little bit as we go along too. And it, like I said, language not, was not a barrier to me. And one thing I do remember a lot you know, when I was young, my parents would go visit other Slovenians in the community here. And I remember the Pogorsiks, who were also, also related to the Smihars, uh, the Novaks, uh, John and Anne Novak. And they loved going there because they could speak Slovenian. And I enjoyed listening to them. It was very good education that was. Um, the other things, too, is that we had, as we were growing up, we had a very small house, a one bedroom house. So at the time, we had four kids, and Bid was still in Yugoslavia. And uh, we had Sister Meech there too, so 
you can understand, uh, imagine how in a cramped household, how things could sort of get out of hand. And the biggest thing that the uh, challenge was uh, that my mom, uh, well, basically what we did, we weren't mean kids, we just teased each other, really, <laughs> relentlessly. So my mom's weapon of choice was a, a dish rag, a wet one, she'd roll it up and then whack over the head. <laughs> it got your attention, it, it worked. <laughs> Then once my brother Big got here, you know, when he was 15 years old, back in about, I think, 57, 59. Anyway, uh, then it was even, the house got even smaller yet. And we were older then, so how did my mom keep the peace? Well, she graduated from the dish rag to, to a boom. So she chases all around the house with a boom. She never connected, but if she ever did, boy, would that get her attention. <laughs> so, uh, okay, Mary, let's slide then. Now, some of you, uh, to your residents here, you might remember some of this. You asked about how uh, you know, to learn English. Well, what happened was they had a night school to learn English, and uh, the refugees or DPs or you know, Slovenian, Croatian, Serbian folks that went to night school, stole school here. Okay? Actually, before I go any further, speaking of stole school, stole school here, which uh, most of us attended here, Harriet Beecher stole school. Okay, when I mentioned to Joe the other night, Joe, just a little bit, so I don't forget. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe was buried at my school in Massachusetts, Phillips Academy, and I would, to get back to the dorm, I would cut through the cemetery and pass by Harriet Beecher Stowe several times a week. So. <laughs> <laughs> what a connection in small world. Yeah. So anyway, this picture here, and my dad is on the left, and right behind him is Joseph Pontich. They were the best of buds. And Joe's family left his whole family back there. He escaped, I mean, even his brother, boys had escaped to the United States here. And it was a number of years before his family reunited here. Uh, uh, yeah. Three children left back along with his wife. And they finally came. But anyway, they're going to English classes here. And who the person that, right behind Joseph Ponsich, that was, if you remember the teacher that taught them, was, it was Miles Luxon. Anybody remember him? Miles Luxon was the teacher. Did a great job with them. And uh, I can't remember, so you can see some of the, somebody mentioned who that lady was right on the right right there, but I, I, I couldn't, I was too young to remember that. But uh, anyhow, the next slide, please. And that, that's, that's when they had their graduation party. It looks like they had a, a cookout or something. And uh, the two guys in the back there with the hats on, that's my dad and Joseph Pontich. Now the guy, the first guy to the left here, right in front, that's Sava Vucinich. Remember Sava? So he was in the class too. And speaking of that, I, I remember, you know, the, it didn't upon, dawn upon me until a couple days ago. I started thinking about these things that, you know, like I said, the name calling, DPs, etc. It wasn't prevalent in, once we got to school. And I think maybe one of the reasons was that uh, Sava Vucinich, the Serbian, had some big Serbian boys. <laughs> Montreal U line. I don't think anybody dared to call them DPs. <laughs> One ended up as a city Duluth policeman, and uh, Milan ended up as a deputy sheriff. So that, uh, that's all that enforced. Yeah, that worked too. Um, okay, so the, the graduation party uh, there for, which leads to the reason they're doing that to become naturalized citizens. So that was in the mid. 50, somewhere too, and, and I remember Joseph Pontich when he went to get his naturalization papers. The judge asks you, you know, questions. You have to know the Pledge of Allegiance. You need to learn, you know, speak English. And you need to, when you play the national anthem, this plate, if you were able bodied, you stand, okay? And I remember Joe telling me that one time that uh, one of the people that was being interviewed for the, to become a U.S. citizen, the judge asked him, though, when you stand in front of the courthouse and you look up, what do you see flying above the courthouse? Told him, pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he had to retake the test for the driver's license and flunked it. Pigeons. <laughs> so. Anyway, so that's when my dad got his citizenship. Uh, and then came. My brother and I, believe it or not, we got our citizenship in, in the high school, we were seniors at Morgan Park in May of 1965, just before we graduated, the two of us went down together to become U.S. citizens. We're so proud of that fact. So that was in 65. Yeah, I remember my mom came here in 1950, okay? 
So it isn't well into the 80s, over 30 years later, she didn't have to, but she wanted to be a U.S. citizen. So she studied and this and that, and she did, she became a U.S. citizen, got her nationalization papers. And right after she did that, I mean, to be an American meant the world to her. So after that, my sister Meech and her, they celebrated by going to a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> the Chinese lantern, very popular. <laughs> Fortunately, they went there before it burned down. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I can just imagine the naturalization process back then. They do the, you know, play the national anthem. Could you imagine somebody taking a knee? I think to this day, that person would still be cleaning the pigeon poop off the courthouse in the winter sense. Yeah. Anyway, that's how it was back then. Um, the next slide, please. Okay, now this picture here, you might, many of you might recognize some of the people here. I, I, I was saying, we attended a, a wedding uh, up in the range, and, and I was the little boy in front looking up, and so I only had to be maybe four years old then, so it was shortly after we got to, to the United States, and it was actually at Elkhorn, it wasn't Gilbert, but we'll call it Gilbert for all practical purposes, right? This Elkhorn. Anyway, I'm looking at the girl with the pigtails. I was thinking, who's that cute little girl there? You know? Oh, that was uh, they pulled up. Vida. It was. And who the little girl is is in front, to, right to my to my right, your left, is another one. Yeah, Elpina. Vida. And we just saw this picture showing to her a couple weeks ago when we were up at Doc Udovich's up in Ely during that thing and we couldn't believe it. Look at that. All these years, all this picture surfaced. And, okay, and who was the wedding was for Lloyd's and Silka Zupancic. And uh, Joe was right in the middle there, my parents are in the back. And if you notice, two priests, that was the, the Dolcina brothers, John and, and uh, Stanley. That's who that is. So this picture really brought back a lot. Oh, and who's way in the back there? Tall, big guy there, Stanley Wolven. So this goes way, way back. Um, okay, this, uh, again, reminiscing about these old photos, it really brings back memories, it's great. It, it, what happens in two is uh, how transitioned as I was growing up, uh, going to back to former Yugoslavia for the first time with my brother Bid, is 1969. 1969, and I couldn't believe how beautiful it was there. And that's where I got my introduction to all the beautiful music, which now I try to carry on that heritage of singing Slovenes and we wear the costumes, etc. But you know, there's more to the heritage than just music, also. How about the cooking? We've got the, the Leopolda and the Shooties, they had the uh, kosher sausage kitchen up there in Gilbert. Excellent the way to keep the heritage alive. And also to our favorite, also, our, we call her our manager, in Tata Franska back there. With her, she makes awesome strudel and potitas. What a way to carry on the heritage, Franska. Excellent. Okay. So that's part of the, you know, the traditions is uh, with the music and, and the food. It's great. And then also I can't, uh, without bringing up our military history, uh, it's really uh, the epitome of being an American, to be able to put that uniform on. And, and it really is something, because my dad, being that he was a military, and to be a citizen of the United States, to have all four sons serving the U.S. military. And uh, our youngest brother, John, was uh, in the U.S. Marines in Vietnam. Brother Andrew, he was in the U.S. Army, Germany. And then the Brother Vid, when he joined, he uh, joined the Army National Guard, but he ended up in the hospital in Fort Jackson, South Carolina in 1963. He was laying in a hospital bed when John F. Kennedy got shot. And then my military history was with the uh, Army Reserve for six years, and then after that I had a 10-year break, and I joined the Air National Guard in 1982, spent over 20, about 23 years there, so a total of 29 years in the military. And they had some great experiences there. They're trading for anything. But what really, I'm really, really proud of uh, my children. They followed my footsteps. And we've got my twin daughters. Brenda's right there. And uh, when she spent time, a tour of Afghanistan, commendable. She worked in personnel. And then Slovenia troops would come through there too. She'd see them. And then her sister is the um, uh, chief of staff, the 133rd Air Between. Uh, we've got uh, our son, Frank, 
Leslie's husband, he's also uh, 148 uh, fighter wing gear, and also our youngest daughter following directly in my footsteps, and she's the supervising recruiter here at the 148, Denise right there, and she spent two tours of duty in Iraq. I mean, that's commendable. And, uh, so. And I can't leave out Sister Meech, although she never served personally in the military herself, but Meech and her husband Dale allowed their son, a uh, good kid, tell you he, after graduation from Mabel High School, he went to Michigan Tech. Was it Michigan, Michigan Tech? And after that, I couldn't believe it, joined the U.S. Navy as an officer on a submarine. That was really, really something. So. Yeah, and Hannah, yeah, Hannah, her granddaughter, she just enlisted to the 148 also. And, you know, I'll tell you this, I'm not possible. What Leslie, her part is, uh, yeah, her husband's in the military, but Leslie works with, with the families of, of people, spouses that are deployed. She works directly with those people, helping them out. And of course, I can't sign off without saying that to her commander in chief is my wife Sharon. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Frank, I have a, uh, just a couple of uh, brief questions. Now, when you started school here in uh, Duluth, uh, how much English did you know when you started? Fluent, because I didn't know anything. Better. Okay, so I could say, oh, that's sort of thing. People thought my dad worked in the steel mill, like a lot of the immigrants that worked in the steel mill. But you know what? Think about it. Some people might have thought of them as being illiterate. They were not bilingual, they were trilingual. Right. Especially in Yugoslavia, they had to learn right. well, Slovenian. They also had to speak Serbic Croatian and then English. Well, yeah. Not to mention German or Italian. Yeah, depending on where you now, how did you know when to be Slovenian and when to be American? <laughs> That's a good question. Good question. Um, what I mean, what's working? Is it a switch or what? I is think it? it is. You know, when somebody whoever starts a conversation off, these speaking in Slovenian, I switch to Slovenian. And sometimes, actually, I want half and half. When you have trouble explaining something, to switch to where the audience is. You've been there, haven't you? <laughs> That's in bold, yeah. <laughs> okay, Frank, uh, we will bring you back for our panel discussion. So, Frank, we'll start. <laughs> uh, we have next on our agenda Mr. Miro Medved. Uh, many of you know him as the Honorary Consul of the Republic of Slovenia. Uh, with his territory being the state of Minnesota. Uh, he emigrated with his brothers and sisters, six siblings, oh, including you, and uh, you've also been able to chronicle your family's transition to Minnesota. And uh, what was that, 65 years ago? Something like that. Okay, I know. Yeah. it's a lot of, a lot of math, but uh, uh, you'll tell us a little bit about uh, your family's experience and your childhood uh, becoming American. So, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nero Medved. So I thought, what would, how would I best describe that? So I thought, probably the best way would be to chronicle our family uh, leaving DP camp uh, and then through our life and then to what we are today. So that's, I think that would be the best way. We stayed in camp like for almost five years, as uh, Frank and everybody else mentioned, uh, with no place to go. Uh, then finally, Argentina opened the borders, and many, many Slovenians went to Argentina. Uh, fortunately, we were not from the first group. <laughs> so we, we uh, finally, the United States opened their borders, and uh, with a, a, a quota system they put in place. Now, the, there you, they had a quota, but you also had to have a sponsor, that somebody in the United States that would actually vouch for you and, and for I think a five year period of time. Uh, we were fortunate, we also knew a priest, Panajan Doshina, which 
was uh, on that one of those slides that everybody had, and he uh, convinced three sisters to sponsor us. They live in Pineville, and uh, may, I mean, maybe some of you know where Pineville is, but it's halfway between Aurora and uh, I mean Aurora and Boabic. So that's was kind of a halfway abandoned uh, mining town. It used to be an underground mine there. So that's where we uh, that our sponsor came from. And, well, the the other thing was, that, of course, the the three sisters took a chance on sponsoring us. They, they had no idea who we were or what kind of people we were. So we, we were very grateful that they, they, to this day. Uh, so after securing the sponsor, uh, we received communication that we are good to go to the United States. So I'm going to show you a picture. This is a picture of our family on the British military truck getting ready to go to uh, a train station with a train that would take us to Bremerhaven uh, ship. Uh, there, there's a story about this picture that's unbelievable. Uh, Frank mentioned a, a book uh, about, uh, that was published about uh, the camp. Uh, it was published about two years ago. And someone sent me the book from, from uh, uh, a Slovenian friend. He said, you'd be interested in the book. And it was all about our, our Spital camp pictures and everything. So I, I contacted them, asked if they would give us uh, some JPEG copies of the pictures because we had a presentation some time ago. And they, they were very cooperative and sent us JPEG pictures. Well, through that, then they, they asked me, they sent me pictures on my uh, computer. They asked me if I could identify people uh, there was a lady in Spital, Austria, who, who chronicled, who was kind of a self-appointed historian for the, for the camp life. Uh, she, uh, she was actually the one that supplied most of the pictures for the book. So she, she would give the pictures to, to the, the publisher and ask to send them to me to see if I could identify people. Which, so I, we did quite a few. I would send the pictures to my friends in Cleveland, Toronto, different places. And we uh, identified quite a few pictures. Uh, so one day, I got another email. This was after several of this kind of uh, requests I got. I got, uh, uh, I opened up the computer, an attachment, and this picture popped up. I mean, That's the ship we came on. She gave it to me for Christmas a couple of years ago. And uh, there's also an uh, actual ship, copy of the ship manifest of the page that shows our family are. So that's, that's the ship we came to, uh, to the United States on. It took us, I think, 11 days. There was a lot of storms and it was really uh, kind of a pretty treacherous uh, trip. Uh, and then uh, when we got to uh, Harbor, we, we, we were sad that we didn't see Statue of Liberty because we didn't go to New York, went to Boston. <laughs> so from Boston then we took a train uh, to Duluth. A l uh, and it was a, a long, a long, long haul. 
and but uh, in Duluth uh, we were met by many of you probably remember Moblang funeral with a we were picked up with a Moblang funeral car. <laughs> there was eight of us there. and Father Schweiger who happened to be a pastor in Gilbert at that time Moblang was headquartered in Gilbert at that time so there was a then it took us to Pineville where we finally met our uh, three sisters the sponsors uh, and the, the first uh, the first few years were pretty difficult for us uh, we, we actually lived I think Frank mentioned the small home they had Small one room. Our our room was big. It used to be a store, and it was one room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the, our three the three sisters who uh, sponsored us lived upstairs. So, and uh, the heat for the uh, uh, room was a potbelly steel stove. That was it, and there was no insulation in the building. Yet. And then when we came there, I think it was like 25 below zero. Uh, so, and the first few days we left uh, water in the kitchen, in a in pot. And of course, it was frozen solid in the morning. We got <laughs> the first learned that you don't leave water. <laughs> um, so, and then uh, we, uh, it was hard. My father, of course, didn't have a job, the no work. Uh, he finally got he got a few odds and ends jobs uh, from people with, uh, in Aurora and Boabic. And uh, but we had a garden. We started a garden from a, a field that was abandoned uh, some years ago. I think there used to be a garden there. And there was a lot of rocks, so we would carry pails of, of rocks out to the side, and we grew potatoes and you know, everything that uh, we needed to you know for food. Uh, then. We, uh, soon later we got quite a cow, somebody brought us a cow, and then we got another cow, so we were a two-cow family. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then, then uh, we also got, had some chickens and a pig. Uh, the cows, the, the cows in that, we had to have a barn. There were some uh, dilapidated uh, buildings on the property that were leaning that we tore those buildings down saving all the material and, and the nails. And one of my jobs was, to, when the nails were out, because they're all in, to, to, with a hammer, to straighten all the nails on a piece of steel. They're all, friends are all black and blue, and I was hit the nail. <laughs> and, uh, so that, that was, uh, uh, from that we built a, a barn, two stuff for two cows and a pig, and then also a place for hay. Uh, and find, uh, I did part, our father did get a full-time job in the Boabic for work for the superintendent of Boabic Mine. He's personally, he was act, he was working like a butler for, for the, uh, he worked on the garden. He even ironed sheets and that that's kind of, and the, per, the superintendent paid him out of his own pocket. That, that was the job he had. Um, and he, to, to go to work, he would walk to, to uh, from Pine to Boabic, which is about two miles. No matter what the weather was, like 10, 20 below, 30 below, hot, because he would say 50 cents, but not taking a bus. It was 25 cents each way. And every day he would put 50 cents in the can. Uh, and from that, uh, from that he uh, uh, bought a lot eventually in Wadik. We built, eventually built a house. Uh, uh, then he trained as a heavy equipment mechanic, and Wadik mine closed down. He, uh, he was a heavy equipment mechanic in the Erie Mine, uh, which most of you know where that is, around off White Lakes. Uh, our focus at our home was always to be good, good citizens, uh, work, work for what you get, and we embraced the American potential, dream potential. We were guided to study well in school and be a credit to our, uh, to our family. Uh, I have to admit, <laughs> I. That was a challenge for my parents. <laughs> I think I was the only one in the family that probably was a challenge. My, my father put a lot of focus on me. <laughs> uh, anyway, all, we were all expected to go to college. We went to college. Uh, uh, we all had successful careers. My brother Frank was an engineer. 
uh, an engineering manager, the chief engineer for Honeywell Test Systems Logistics Business. He designed the system for Mariner uh, Mars Space Shuttle, NASA's original eight station space tracking network and aircraft. My brother Alvin, who's also. <laughs> Alvin was also here, uh, became, was uh, an engineer, but he then became a lawyer, and eventually was a vice president at Honeywell for the patent and intellectual properties. Oh, my, my sister Bernardo, um, uh, the math teacher, he taught, she taught at uh, U.S. military schools around the world and later in the state of Arizona. Uh, my sister Chris, younger sister who passed away a couple of years ago, was a mathematics teacher. Worked for a number of major food companies, including Pillsbury, uh, Green Giant, and ended up as vice president for consumer research at Land Lakes. Wow. My brother John uh, uh, got a degree from the University of Minnesota in, in business and has a construction business specializing in maintenance and restoration of historic homes. So that's, I feel our family has made our American dream come true. So. Well, I, have a, I have a couple of questions. Um, as you're one of our speakers who remembers life in Slovenia before, and then you went through the camp experience, and then resettlement in Minnesota. Uh, can you describe some of the feelings or emotions you went through in in that transitional process as a child? Yeah, well, leaving Slovenia, I was still a little, so I, re I remember uh, a few things, but uh, uh, like some people mentioned, when you're a child, you don't, you don't remember the hardships. Okay. We remember the good times we had, but, or, and, but uh, I... Uh, one one thing that I recall that it was we always I was taught if somebody offered you will you go visit to pop you some food, you it was always uh, because people didn't have much you always declined. We were taught we were told to decline. But then you played this game and said then they offered three, four times and they said, Okay, well just a little bit. <laughs> well we came to the United States, we were invited to someone's home and they said, Would you like some of this? And they said, No, thank you and they walked away. <laughs> I was so hungry. <laughs> After a while, we learned that when they offer you something nice, they they mean it. <laughs> Thank you, Miro. We're going to bring you back up when we have a discussion. We have um, uh, Teresa Mihalich Meinhardt. Teresa? Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, Teresa came here at age 12 in 1956. Um, and she will give us the girls' experience because there was probably a difference with how boys experienced the transition and with girls, and uh, also uh, what they had to overcome in making a new life here in the United States. So let me present Teresa Mihalich, my heart. Uh, Frank's wife, she thought they should be a woman in this panel. <laughs> so I was asked to present, be a presenter fairly recently, so I don't have any technology or photos. Um, my story is a little different. Uh, I did not actually go through the refugee camp. Uh, my father left uh, in Slovenia after World War II for the same reasons that the other families, or he would have been killed. Uh, you know, and the reason we didn't go, we had no, my parents had no transportation. Mm, there were six of us from a family of seven girls. There were six of us at that time, and my mother was pregnant with my youngest sister. So, and later, we learned about my dad. He, he was in Austria for almost six, uh, a month before without any food. And he actually had a photo taken of himself and we saw it years later, I mean, I mean his skeleton. And so it's, it's a good thing that we didn't all, as a family, go. Um, and the hunger you know, that was mentioned, you know, when you get your horse, who was going in a refugee camp, 
it wasn't that different in Slovenia after World War because things were so disorganized and um, because you were in the wrong side of the, you know, not the winner side, what food was left, they kept it. So um, we did not have much food. And I was two and a half years old when my dad left, so I don't remember the same thing as a child, you don't remember. <coughs> But I do remember kind people bringing food to our house, and that's how my mother and my sister survived right after the war. Uh, when the Red Cross came in, you know, they would, uh, they, they had food, and they were required to uh, give it to everyone, And but we got a lot of cornmeal. We had a lot of polenta after that. <laughs> And I do, I do remember some the hunger, I mean, you know, bread was, bread was sacred. And I remember one time asking my mother for some, she gave me a piece that I thought was too small, you know, I wanted more. And um, she said, no, eat that first and you can have some more. And I was somewhat of a willful child, I'm afraid. <laughs> I threw the bread because I was so angry. I had to kneel down and pick it up and kiss it and it took me a long time. <laughs> I, rem I remember this memory. I had my mother on one side tell me to do it, and my oldest sister on the other side conjoined me, just go and do it, go and do it. <laughs> I finally did. But anyway, so um, I grew up in Slovenia, the communist Slovenia after World War II. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, things got somewhat better, but there were, besides the hunger at first, uh, there were other problems. My mother would talk often how when she would walk with us, my sisters and herself, and they would be a couple of communists drove by on their bicycles and made a comment, we'll have to clean this up one of these days too. And I remember, um, it was a spring day, so it was a spring after World War II, so I must have been about three years old. Um, we were getting ready to go out and play because it was a gorgeous spring day, and all of a sudden my mother told us we couldn't. And she was so frightened, and she told us to stay away from the window. And of course, I had to go and see. <laughs> you know, I ran to the window, and there were soldiers outside of our uh, of our house. Um, and I remember, I, I'm sure I remember this because my mother just stood in the kitchen, and she was just like rooted, and just kept saying, "The war's over. Why are they here? You know, the war's over. Why are they here?" So, but nothing happened. Some years later, we did learn that they were there to come to clean up. And it was some lady who was a communist, but you know, Slovenia is a basically good folks, you know, the people who brought us food. And this woman told us, you know, if you got something against him, meaning my dad, go after him, you know, but you can't do that, you know. And they, she, she did talk them out of that. And um, of course then, um, my father, actually, you did see a photo of him. Uh, Frank had the, he was a choir director. He was the one on the photo. And he was a choir director at home. And we lived in a house that was not far from the church uh, because he was a choir director. We lived there and it was a nice several room apartment. And it was several years after that that uh, the commercials, we had to move. And they were, so we ended up living in a very small two-room apartment until we, we moved, came to move here. And, um, and there were, you, I guess what it is, because, you know, my father left, it was almost made to feel like, you know, why are you still here? It, it would make you feel unwelcome. And uh, in school was more, I mean, it's like at first when you went to school, they asked you if you were going to church and stuff, and that was not a good thing, you know. And at that time, I think have changed considerably in Slovenia. I want to make sure, you know, sure you understand that. But at that time, uh, uh, it was very, I mean, if you were not a communist, you could not be a teacher, you could not be a doctor, you could not uh, be a foreman in a factory. I mean, no leadership type of you know, Thing. In school, we were given lower grades, so you could somebody who was of a communist family would be the higher up rather than us. So there was no, um, you know, future there. And so when my father, he was actually one of the last people that migrated to, uh, um, uh, to here to America. You know, and it was like somebody mentioned they didn't want to leave my dad, and he was he thought well. You know, once this settles down, you know, he would be able to come back to Slovenia. And it became obvious he couldn't. 
So he did come here, and then when he became a citizen, uh, we applied for, and we came here with the visa, my mother and my sisters, and we came here in 1956, and I was 12 years old. And of course, didn't speak English, and were plunked in a classroom. I was in a se put in seventh grade, and myself and my Martina, there were the four youngest ones went to school, my oldest three sisters went to work. But my, uh, Martina and yeah. I went in seventh grade, and Vida and Lugino went into third grade. And um, yeah, the uh, couldn't speak English, but they had two girls who were from Slovenian families, and they spoke a little bit Slovenian. So they took Martina and I, you know, a one, a one hour uh, each day, of course, was a study hour, and they would teach us for them. They had this group, uh, the books, the same as the people, you know, children learn. And we, I thought we were learning. And of course, I didn't have a problem with math. I did well with math at home. So uh, we were learning, but I guess not fast enough for some of the teachers. I but remember very clearly, I learned enough, I knew. This history teacher was just enraged that we were in her class. Um, the way she thought is everybody read the chapter that we were on, and she made certain that Martina and I got to read, and of course couldn't pronounce the words, and then she just raved on and on, how, what were we doing here? We should be in a classroom where people are learning English. So they put us back in the third grade with my younger sisters, and that was really um, kind of depressing, because as it was mentioned before, I was, you know, you learn other languages. Uh, well, in Slovenia, I was already taking German. We had to study Serbian because it was Yugoslavia, and Serbian was a national language. Um, had algebra already, and then all of a sudden, you're sitting here in third grade, in a back row, you know, just sitting there. The teacher was not trained to teach someone who didn't speak English. You know, I, I don't blame her. She there was not much she could do. Well, we did learn, like everybody else, you know, with associating with other children and stuff, we learned English. Um, and then uh, we moved to Gilbert after that. First we lived in Gilbert. Gilbert was much better. The school, they were more interested in uh, promoting us, and I actually got to skip sixth grade and eighth grade, so I graduated closer to the people, you know, my age. And, um, I don't know, I guess it's fine. <laughs> So, um, would you say, was it more difficult for girls than for boys to make the transition to the U.S., or was it easier or the same? How would you describe it? I, probably the same. Or I, I didn't find it too difficult, except, you know, the school part for a while, and, but other than that. Um, did you feel, well, you were familiar with Slovenians here in the mm -hmm. United States. Oh yes, I wanted to mention sure. that. That was very helpful because my dad was here already and these other families were fairly established and I remember Sundays were always special times and Sunday afternoon we would often go. Uh, different families would invite, kind of said, you know, come over and we would, there was Slovenian music, even dancing, food, and, and that was very helpful. Okay. We're going to have another discussion afterwards. Thank you, Teresa. We have our next speaker is on Skype from Cleveland, and that's Monica Bukovic Rode. Uh, as we discussed, there's a very sizable post World War II uh, emigre community in Argentina, and uh, Monica's parents uh, made the transition from Slovenia to, uh, to Argentina after World War II. So she's first generation born in Argentina, but then after the uh, um, independence of Slovenia, she moved uh, to uh, Slovenia, uh, where she became a math professor. She is also married to uh, Andre Rodet, who is the Consul General of the Republic of Slovenia, uh, stationed in Cleveland, uh, the only foreign diplomat in the state of Ohio. Uh, and yes, he is the nephew of uh, uh, Franz Rodel, who uh, was mentioned earlier. And uh, Monica's parents were young when they moved to Argentina. First, I would like to say to everyone hello and apologize for not being there personally. I was born in Argentina. I'm first generation there. My dad uh, was born in Slovenia and my mom was born in Angola, in Italy. Uh, so I'm an only child, so I live with my 
my friend and my grandmother. And in my house, it was all the time speaking in Slovenia, eating Slovenian food, uh, praying in Slovenia, going to Slovenia mass. So everything was colored Slovenia. Um, when I began school, uh, Argentinian school, uh, I wasn't fluent in Spanish. Uh, so it was quite tough, that part of the story. I was quite a silent child. But also, in, uh, when we got into school, I began Slovenian school. In Argentina, we have, and still they have, uh, Saturday school for primary and for secondary. So what is in here, high school. And it's every Saturday, so it's quite tough. You have to learn and be a good student there. Um, it, it was easy because of that, because, for example, you have the Slovenian school, you have the clubs, which are uh, all connected in between, so they, although they are separated, they are communicating in between. So you can organize different activities like um, um, theater, uh, poetry evenings, uh, uh, what else, sport events, uh, a lot of activities. So that keeps us going and moving. And uh, the good thing for me was that when I was there, when I was young uh, and being the first generation, I was lucky to have people who came from Slovenia who were teachers uh, or college professors. Uh, you can say a kind of, um, how can I say, a cultural elite. We have very, very prepared people for, for making us good in Slovenia. So that keeps us going and speaking in Slovenia and and well, uh, keeping the Slovenian in customs. Um, they are still doing that. Uh, it's more free now. Uh, when I was there, for example, being part of some uh, Argentinian activity, well, it was difficult because you have everything with your Slovenian community. So you don't, you didn't need to go out of that close group of Slovenians. These days, the Slovenians are more participating with, with other Slovenian um, clubs or activities. So it's open in, in that way. So, yeah, it was easy to be, to keep Slovenian uh, roots. So, um, I don't know, uh, if you are interested in, in something, um, well, can I can I ask you a question? Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, wh well, growing up in Argentina, what was your impression of Slovenia, the land that your family basically had to leave, or former Yugoslavia? And then, what was your feeling? Uh, let me put it this way. What did Slovenia mean to you growing up, and what did Argentina mean to you growing up? Well, I, was, I have to say that I'm a strange, a strange case, but Slovenia uh, meant everything for me. So, uh, my dad was always thinking on, uh, about Slovenia, of what he left, like that Argentina is just a uh, temporary also, my grandmother, I was a long time with my grandmother, and my grandmother was always, you know, she would like to go back, especially in her case because she left kids in Slovenia. So she was still attached, very most attached to Slovenia. So uh, for me, it was Slovenia number one. Uh, if someone asked me who I am, I would, I, I said, and I'm still saying I am Slovenian and if they then they ask me yes but you were born in Argentina yeah I was born there but I'm Slovenian in my dad is Slovenian but, uh, I have Slovenian citizenship but Argentina is just a paper I mean I have the chance to be born there and I'm glad I'm very grateful that they accepted my parents in, in that moment of their life but that's it I always uh, felt much, much more for Slovenia. 
Um, kids these days are getting more involved with Argentinian uh, culture and it's different. But yeah, I'm being an only child, I, I, got, I was very submersive being Slovenian. Well, Monica, you have an unusual situation in that you end up going back. You're basically born and raised in Argentina, and then this uh, uh, Slovenia that Mama and Babica talked about uh, becomes your new land. What was that transition like? Very easy. Everyone in Argentina thought that I will miss a lot. Again, because being an only child, I'm very really attached to my cousins and everything. And maybe feeling alone when I, when I will be back in Slovenia. But when I came to Slovenia, the first day I was saying, well, this is like every day. Much better because I can speak Slovenian whenever. Uh, going to do the shopping is in Slovenia. Everything was so natural. So like... Like I was born there, there was no difference. Uh, in the contrary, I felt that everything had a meaning. Why I kept the Slovenian, why I had all those customs, why I used Naruta Nosha in certain events. It was all like a puzzle, like the last piece of a puzzle. I feel completed when I went back. So yeah, I was very lucky to have that chance. I'm very grateful. Okay. All right. Monica, thank you very much. Thank you for standing by and keeping. <laughs>